your face mask if you would like to do so. And we do ask people to uh, remain in your seats for the entire service. And if you just must get up, uh, please put your face mask back on, fully cover your nose and mouth. And if you're going to be within six feet of anybody, make sure you give them a chance to do so as well. Sometimes this is just a little tricky, but I think I've got it now. There we go. <laughs> well, I want to welcome everybody to our worship service today and wish you a very Merry Christmas. As I was telling our deacons this morning when we had a brief meeting that on the Christian calendar, the season of Christmas begins on Christmas Day and lasts until Epiphany, which is January 6th. And so it's entirely appropriate to say Merry Christmas to people up until then. And uh, I just really hope that the Christmas spirit will be felt deeply in your hearts during this entire season of Christmas. I want to welcome any guests that we might have. I don't think I see anybody that's, that's um, brand new or hasn't been here in the last few weeks. So I'm going to kind of skip over some of those details. Um, and I'm just really glad that everybody's here today who's here. Um, but just make sure you're aware of our guidelines uh, for the pandemic on the top of page five. And um, mainly for those of you that are watching on video, if you'd like to make a gift, you can do so online. And uh, just make sure in the comments section on our giving page on our website that you make a comment um, if, uh, if there's anything in particular you'd like to give um, to the church. Otherwise, it will just go to our general fund, which we deeply, deeply appreciate and need to run the church. Um, I haven't heard if we have enough people for Salvation Army this Wednesday. D does anybody know? Do we need some more volunteers? I'm not sure who's in charge even this week. Amber. Amber. So if you'd like to volunteer on Wednesday, give Amber a call, and she should know 
if there's enough. And there's only a, um, a there's a limit. They, they can only take so many people, but we want to make sure that we have enough people to go on Wednesday to, to feed the hungry people in Hanapepe. And we always appreciate volunteers. And um, Amber, I'm sure if she uh, needs some help, she'll reach out. But uh, if, if you want to help, just give her a call. And then um, we took a little break from Ho'okipa, Rose Tatiana's class, right afterwards, uh, the last few weeks, just because we've had a lot of other things going on. But Ho'okipa will happen right after church again today. So those of you that would like to stay and stretch and relax and meditate and listen to Rose Tatiana's soothing voice um, as you do so, we just ask that you either stay in the seat that you're in for the worship service or check with Rose if you um, are in Moore Hall and want to come over or if, or if you would like to sit in a different seat. And that's just for the sake of the pandemic, just so that we're not spreading germs. And... Um, the only other announcement that I want to highlight is on January 19th, I'm very excited to announce that uh, Reverend Dr. David Vasquez-Levy, the president of Pacific School of Religion, will be, will be back here giving a talk. And I don't remember the exact title. I, I'm sure, I, I know it's on the weekly news. And we'll, we're actually going to put it in the Garden Island newspaper and we'll remind people the, the week before. But um, just save that date on your calendar. David is a remarkable speaker. And when he came a few years ago and talked about immigration and policy and what a Christian response is, we had people that had come to our church that hadn't been here before that said, get more people like him to come because our, cause we need to hear some of those challenges um, for us. Because sometimes here we are isolated in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, reading the newspaper and hearing things and wondering what we can do. And so David is just a fan, one of my favorite speakers. I could listen to him for hours. I promise you he won't be speaking for hours. <laughs> but, but basically the theme that he, his presentation is going to be is, is what is Pacific School of Religion doing now in terms of our mission? What are we doing um, in, in terms of the, the broad um, picture, the umbrella? And uh, he's going to be talking about how we want to train leaders to make a difference in the 21st century and what does spirituality have to do with that. Um, and I've heard him talk on this subject before, and he's just, he, I, I think he's just so right on. And I'm going to see if we can get that taped as well so people who can't be here can watch it on video. But if you can be here at all, please come. We're also going to recognize the two people that have now, as of this last a few weeks ago, received their certificate in Theological Education for Leadership from Pacific School of Religion. And one of those people is Tiffany Marotti, our um, Sunday School uh, superintendent, uh, teacher, and youth leader. And uh, she's actually going to be preaching, um, I think it's next week. So anyway, come and support Tiffany and also, or maybe two weeks from now. But um, on the 19th, we will officially, as PSR, recognize Tiffany and also Linda Kaovai Iwamoto from uh, First Hawaiian uh, Church in Kapa'a. Uh, but it'll just be a fun celebratory time as well as a time to really be challenged by David to think about what we need to do as a church to prepare new leaders in the church for the future. So please come to that if you can and put it on your calendar now, January 19th, a Wednesday night. And then do look at the rest of the bulletin um, items just so that you know what all of our important announcements are. We will be taking a break for a couple of weeks from the weekly news, um, but just know that you'll be getting that again in a few weeks. So today, I want to just focus for a moment on some of what Christmas has meant to us throughout our lives. And as we begin our worship service, I'd like for you to think of a memory of Christmas that you hold very dear. And it could be a tradition from childhood. It could be something that happened more recently. It could be something that just happened yesterday. But think of something that is just really important to you in, in terms of a cherished memory of Christmas. And just give thanks for that as we begin our worship service today. Today's call to worship <clears throat> is inspired by the prayer of Hannah found in the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Come, let us worship God and find strength in the presence of the Lord. For there is no holy one like the Lord. There is no rock like our God. The Lord is a God of knowledge. 
Let us come before the Lord in humility with our proud or arrogant talk <clears throat> coming from our mouths. The Lord seeks, breaks the weapon of the mighty, but gives strength to those who are feeble. The Lord is present in both life and death, accompanying his faithful ones down to the depths and once again when we are raised up. The Lord raises up the poor from the dust and the nearly needy from each ash heap to make them all alongside the wealthy and powerful where they inherit the seat of honor among the members of royal family. The Lord will guard the field of the faithful ones, giving both strength and honor to all who seek the Lord. Let us worship. God and find strength in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, in this season of Christmas, we give you thanks for your presence in our midst and for all the strength and comfort you provide. We remind you, reminded that who created this abundant world, deeply desire that we all share with one another so that the hungry have food, the sick are healed, those who suffer from unjust chains are set free, and those who are weak find strength. As we worship you today, open our eyes so that we will see what is lacking in our own lives. Open our ears so that we can hear the cries of all those who live with anxiety and fear. Open our hearts so that we would be moved to show compassion to ourselves and to others. And may the love of God guide us in our actions, our speech, and in our prayers. Amen. Today's Old Testament is a reading from the Psalm 148. Listen to the word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise God, all the angels. Praise God, all the heavenly host. Praise God, sun and moon. Praise God, all ye shining stars. Praise God, you highest heavens, and your waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for God commanded, and they were created. The Lord established them and forever and ever, and fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth. You see monsters that aren't that are in the ocean depth, fire and hell, snow and frost, stormy wind, wind filling God's perfect, God's command, mountains and all the hills, <clears throat> fruit trees and all the cedars, wild animals and all the cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Rulers of the earth and all people, all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for God's name alone is exalted. God's glory is above earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up a horn for the people Praise for all God's faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to the Lord. Praise the Lord. Ah, guess what? I can't change the page. Let's see here. There we go. <laughs> 
because this is a very, very familiar uh, issue. I'm sure the pastor is going to be talking about it. I, as a parent, had a one, had a 12-year-old boy at one time who was rather willful sometimes, and I have a 12-year-old grandson who is very willful. And how I thought of him, them, as I read this this morning. This comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Listen to the word of God. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. And when the festival was ended, they started to return. The boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went on a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, <clears throat> sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding, his answers, and when the parents <clears throat> saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you. Great anxiety. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. <clears throat> then he went down with them and came to Nazareth, was obedient to them. His mother treasured these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. And may our hearts be open to receiving it. Will hear the dead 
Christmases. For one thing, every Christmas Eve up until this last year, I'm here with most of you in a very crowded sanctuary with standing room only and people standing way back out there and over there and we're singing songs together. And it occurred to me on Christmas Eve that this is, this is just a really different kind of Christmas for Many of us, maybe all of us. The other thing for me personally was usually my son, Polani, is with me either for Christmas or New Year's or somewhere over the holidays. And now that he's all grown up and engaged to be married to a woman that lives in England, he's spending two weeks on the other side of the world. And I'm not going to probably see him at all, maybe until the wedding. But it just seems like this is a different kind of Christmas. And I remember thinking, it's still really good. And one of the things that has helped sustain that goodness for me is the memories. And so the last few days, I've been thinking a lot about Christmas for me over the years. And as a child, I think I loved everything about Christmas. It was just one of the most delightful times of the year when we would open up the boxes and pull out the nativity set, when we would decorate the Christmas tree, when my grandmother would come to visit. Every year, one of our favorite traditions is mom would make every one of her favorite Christmas cookies and candies, and sometimes us kids would get to help, and we certainly got to help decorate the, the cutout cookies, and there was always a Santa Claus and a candy cane, and we just love creating these things. But every year, my mom would put these beautiful plates together, very large plates with candy and cookies and little treats all over and wrap them in beautiful cellophane and tie a ribbon around the top. And we would bring those to almost every one of our neighbors on the block and always have one for my grandmother as well that was with us almost every Christmas. And then when I got to middle school, lo and behold, my family bought a Christmas tree farm. And it was over 200 acres up in the Siskiyou Mountains near the Oregon border. And so every year in the summer from that point on, my family would load up the truck and we would haul stuff all the way up to the Oregon border and we would work on the Christmas tree farm. We would mark trees. We would um, clear. We, uh, you know, basically the, when it was clearing day, we would, you know, clear space around the really nice looking trees so that they had plenty of room to grow up and just be perfect trees. And then, of course, in the 
late fall, we would go and cut just the right amount of the perfect trees, and especially my mom was the business one in the family that took orders from banks, and how tall would you like your tree this year, and so on and so forth. But there was just these traditions that I remember that I don't have anymore, and also um, special people in my life, my grandmother and my parents really close friends that I've spent Christmas with before that are no longer here. But I thought about those memories and thought, thank God that I have so many good memories. As I was growing up, I just kind of assumed everybody loved everything about Christmas every year for the rest of their lives. But very soon as I started working in churches and training for ministry, I realized that Christmas can be and is a very hard time for many people. And I remember early on, I, I met a friend who said, um, you know, uh, her parent had died during that year, and this was going to be the first Christmas without that parent. And just how deeply difficult that was, just the, 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 the feeling of darkness, I think, just this is going to, Christmas is going to be really hard this year. And, and I, soon after that, I met another friend who said that his parent was abusive and um, things got really bad at Christmas time. And so Christmas wasn't all about good memories for him at all like it was for me. Christmas was a time of remembering just how bad abuse could be. And then I met other friends, of course, over the years and people in churches that said, I kind of have to brace myself for Christmas because there's a lot going on and there's a lot of tension. In fact, I have one friend that basically says, because of all the tension, I hate Christmas. And my heart broke. I just thought, why don't you just get rid of the tension and enjoy Christmas? But I realized that some of that tension is so prevalent that we often create within our families and our communities, sometimes our churches even, and especially in our minds. And we think there's things we have to do and Christmas needs to be perfect in this perfect box that we've imagined that doesn't really exist. Tension at Christmas time is something I don't remember as a kid, but I certainly have felt it over the years personally growing up and know many people who have felt the tension of the holidays. Passover for Jesus and his family is probably the closest thing back then to our modern-day Christmas. It was their major holiday in which the Jewish people celebrated new life, new potential, freedom, and the focus was the exodus of the Jewish people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And that holiday involved tradition. For any of you that have ever seen Fiddler on the Roof many times, every time I, see, every time I hear that song, I think, oh, I, I can relate. And Jesus could relate too, because there was traditions, there were things that his family and his extended family just expected of him and of everybody else. And one of the traditions that his family did is every year they left Nazareth and traveled down to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And every year they would travel together and they would be there over the Passover. And after they did all their celebrating, I'll just tell you, and experiencing their tension, then everybody would get together and go back up. They would walk back to Nazareth. Well, of course, as we learned in today's story, one day Jesus, as a 12-year-old, decided that he was going to go into the temple and teach those elders a little bit about what they really need to be talking about, I'm sure. So his parents, Mary and Joseph, just weren't really paying attention, I guess. And they traveled an entire day. It's probably a two-day journey, but, you know, at the end of day one, they had traveled all these miles and probably said, well, where's Jesus? I don't know. I thought you knew. No, I don't know where Jesus is. I, you're supposed to be 
t- taking care of him. And that's not my job because I'm the woman. You can just hear the, the, the tension between Mary and Joseph. And, and Luke doesn't get into that, but I guarantee that there weren't just all positive words of happiness exchanged between Mary and Joseph and the immediate family. And some Christians... I, for one, believe that Jesus had siblings. Others believe that Mary never had another child. But whatever the case is, if Jesus had brothers and sisters, I'm pretty sure that Mary or Joseph pointed the finger at some of them, saying, why weren't you watching Jesus? We told you he was special. You guys are supposed to keep your eyes on him too. Well, anyway, they get all the way up to wherever it was when they realized that Jesus wasn't with them. And the two of them, at least, we don't know if other people accompanied them, Luke doesn't tell us, but Mary and Joseph went an entire day's journey back to Jerusalem. And Luke tells us that they looked for Jesus for three days. And we don't know if it was including, you know, being without Jesus part of the travel days, or three solid days after being without him for a day going up and a day going back. But whether whether it was three days or five days or whatever, imagine being a parent of a 12-year-old boy. And as Grace Eleanor said, she has had a 12-year-old boy and a 12-year-old grandson. I bet you would be a little concerned if you were in a strange city, Grace Eleanor, (laughs) and that 12-year-old boy was somewhere in this big city and you had no idea where he was and you were spending days looking for him. Imagine the tension building even more. Well, as the story goes, of course, Mary and Joseph must have just been exasperated, and they go to the temple, probably just to pray, and ask God, what do we do next? And they see a crowd of some of the most intelligent, like the top leaders of the temple, of their nation, huddled around someone, and they're all just listening to him, and as they look over there to see what going on, they realize it's Jesus in the middle of this circle. And as they get closer, they realize that Jesus is teaching them. He's he's answering their questions. And this is what I imagined it would be like if you had a 12-year-old boy and you went to Washington, D.C., and you lost him. You were going to all the monuments, and you just were like after three days going, I don't know what else to do. I've called the police. We've, we've looked everywhere. And then you just think, okay, well, let's go to one more place. And you're passing the Supreme Court and all the justices are out there sitting on the bench, sitting in a circle listening to your 12-year-old boy. You would just be blown away, right? So that had to be something like what it was for Mary and Joseph. And of course, Mary's first words is, are, are why did you treat us like this? And Jesus kind of, I think, scratches his head and is like, what are you talking about? What, where else would I be? I'm, I'm in my father's house. But as I read the story and heard Grace Eleanor read it again today, I'm thinking, you know, every family has some tension. And Jesus' family was no different. And as I was reading the story this week, a couple questions popped up into my head right away. And it's just those automatic questions. When you read some of these stories, that question just pops up. And so the first question is, did Jesus actually do something wrong? Should Jesus have not stayed behind in the temple? Should Jesus have warned his parents and not assumed that they would know where he would be? Should Jesus have just not even been there? What blame ought we to put on Jesus? And then the same thing with Mary. It's like, did Mary do something wrong? Mary and Joseph? Shouldn't they have checked before they went on this long journey that their 12-year-old boy was with them, knowing what 12-year-old boys are like? Should they have at least checked after an hour or two? Shouldn't they have trusted God more? Did you hear all of those shoulds? All of those oughts. Well, as you read this beautiful story in Luke, what surprises me is Luke doesn't dwell at all on blame. He points out that there's differences and expectations and roles, and you've got Mary asking a simple question, why did you do this to us? Why did you create all this anxiety on us? Didn't you know? And you have Jesus 
asking a question in return, and then, as Luke tells us, obediently following them back. And I think what Luke is pointing at is regardless of blame, and and without focusing on blame, thinking what needs to happen when there is tension. And you can see Mary and Joseph on the one side, on the one hand, and Jesus on the other hand, coming together, talking about what it was like for them. You know, Mary being really clear what it felt like for her, not knowing where he was all those days, and Jesus talking about his perspective. But the point is, they went home together. They decided that whatever the misunderstandings were, they were still family. They were going to work it out. And Jesus obeyed them, and as the scripture tells us, grew in, as a person and in favor both with God and with his parents. Divine and human favor, as we read it this morning. Well, as I was thinking about this picture of Jesus and the tension and and all that, I think part of what Luke was really doing was just saying, you know, I want to make it really clear who Jesus was. He was unique. He was different from the other kids. There's no question. You don't find kids teaching the smartest men in the land in the temple. Jesus was unique. But Jesus was also kind of like every other kid whose parents worried about him and experienced anxiety and maybe wasn't thinking, before I make this decision, let me process all that this means to my parents. He was just being a normal 12-year-old boy. And the point is, Jesus was divine And Jesus was human. And Luke, I think, is just trying to point out what it took the church some 300 years to kind of articulate. And what I mean by that is in the year 325, so some 300 years after Jesus, Constantine, who was the the king, the emperor, gathered a bunch of bishops together. In fact, he said, I want all 1,800 bishops in the Christian church to come together and we, or you, but together, will decide who Jesus was. And they decided that Jesus was fully God and fully human. And up to that point, there were people who believed that Jesus was fully God and not really human at all. And other people, Christians, believed, well, we believe in the full humanity of Jesus, but How is he any more divine than me? There were lots of questions that people were asking back then because there was no teaching in the church that said, this is what everybody must believe. And so in Nicaea, which is now in modern-day Turkey in the year 325, those 1,800 bishops were all invited, and 300 or so actually showed up. And that's what they came up with. Jesus is fully divine and fully human. Now, I want you to know that in most indigenous cultures, that just kind of makes sense. There's no problem with that. In in Hawaiian culture, for example, my ancestors believe that, you know, if if when I die, I, I go to another place, but I can come back in human form. I can have a conversation with you. I can also come back as a shark or a turtle or an owl. And this idea that you can be fully divine and fully human, or fully animal for that matter, is just kind of that, that's how indigenous people think. But in our Western culture, we've really divided very dualistically, here's what's alive, here's what's dead, here's what's good, here's what's bad, here's what's divine, here's what is secular or physical. But you know, as I've read over the Old Testament over and over again, I often see that there are sacred and divine physical realities. The Old Testament talks about holy ground. My goodness, even a bush can be alive with God and divine. The burning bush on fire. That's God infused in a bush. And over and over again, we can think of examples of where People were filled with the Holy Spirit to the point that when they speak, it's like God speaking. We sometimes have a hard time wrapping our head around that. 
But let me just read to you some of the words from the Nicene Creed, which came out of the Council of Nicaea, also called the First Council of Nicaea in the year 325, this document that they came up with. And of course, this has been translated many times into several English versions, but this one goes like this. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. But then, if you read on, for us and our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. And I wish I could tell you that now that they got that figured out, there was never any more tension within the church. Wouldn't that be nice? There was no more conflict. Everybody got along and everybody agreed. And no, but no church has ever split up anymore because everyone said, okay, we've got this figured out. We know who Jesus is. Now let's live happily together ever after. Well, as you know, I'm sure, churches have been splitting up ever since and people have been arguing. And often after the Council of Nicaea, if you disagreed with church teaching, even if you questioned it, you were labeled a heretic and often killed. And if you were a large enough group, say a nation or part of a nation, the church and the church slash state would go to war with you and thousands of people would die. So we know that tension and conflict didn't end at that point. It should have, at least I think so. But here we are continuing to live with tension. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, just turn on the news for about 30 seconds and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Especially when you hear people talk about their Christian faith and therefore they believe something that can't be questioned, even though I often do. The, ten the tension seems to always be right there in front of us around us and among us. It's something we've come to live with. And I just want to say one of the things I really, really, really appreciate, uh, appreciate about this church, Koloa Union Church, is that when people disagree, you still love one another. I wish I could just count on one or two hands, how many times some of you have come up to me and said, I'm not sure I agree with you on that, Kahu, but I've never felt like you stopped loving me. And I also know that some of you disagree with each other on things that might be really important to you. And yet we come together, we pray together, we share meals together, we love each other. And as I'm thinking about this story of the tension within Jesus' family, remembering that they went home together. I think that is so important that no matter what we feel or believe or think, whether it's exactly the same as the person sitting next to us or entirely different, that we honor each other amidst the tension, just like Jesus and his parents went home together. Well, I'm pretty sure that you will continue to feel some tension at Christmas and over the holidays simply because we are human beings and we are communities and we are church and we are families and we are a nation. And there's always going to be disagreements. But hopefully, and my prayer for all of us is in the midst of that tension, we will agree to love each other and respect and honor each other just like Jesus did with Mary and Joseph and just like they did with him. Amen. And in a moment, we're going to have our prayers, and it uh, looks like we've got at least one prayer card coming up. But before we read these, we have a very special prayer and a quilt that goes along with this, and I'm going to ask
Bonnie and Sheila to come up and, and hold it up for everybody to see while I talk about it for just a moment. And those of you that know about Prayers and Squares, um, will, will, this is a, will be a little bit of a repeat for you. But those of you who don't know, and especially those online, we have a wonderful group of volunteers at the church that create just stunning, beautiful quilts. And as we tie each knot in the quilt, we say a prayer. And our tradition typically is, when there's not a pandemic going on, we will, I, the pastor ties the first knot and says a prayer and then we pass it around and have each person tie a knot while saying a prayer. But because of the pandemic, I will tie the first knot, and then um, I'll just have a moment of silence right afterwards so that we can all have a chance to say a prayer, and then the volunteers, Prayers and Squares, will go ahead and, and tie all the knots. So this is for Peggy Gregory. Um, many of you know Julie Ockrey, who is a good friend of, of, of many of you, actually, and she's worshipped here together. She uh, lives here in town, and um, Julie's mom, Peggy, has a blood clot and is um, in pain and suffering in a memory um, institution, a assisted living memory care unit, in fact. And so um, the Prayers and Squares group asked, if, um, asked Julie if her mom would appreciate a prayer quilt, and they would love one. So I would like to say the first prayer for Peggy. And if you would join with me in this prayer, and then afterwards, just say your own prayer during our time of silence. Let us pray together. Our gracious God, we pray for Peggy and ask that you relieve her of her suffering, that you heal her body. And we also pray for all those who are caring for her and care about her, that you would bless them, give them wisdom and patience and love for her. And as she receives this quilt, may she also receive all of our love and our prayers, even now as we continue to pray for her in silence. Amen, and thank you very much. Thank you to the Prayers and Squares volunteers as well. I just uh, want everybody to know what a difference they make when people receive these quilts. And I'm, I often have the privilege of sometimes delivering the quilt, but also being with people right after they receive it. And they often have tears in their eyes and just feel so deeply grateful for not only knowing that we're praying, but having something physical, like some, something so beautiful that they can place over them, knowing that those prayers are represented in every knot. We also have, um, from Marie, Kathy, friend of Marie's, um, has cancer surgery, and so we'll pray for good results, Marie, for your friend Kathy. Some of you may have heard this on the news, Desmond Tutu died, I think, just last night. But, um, you know, just such an amazing light to the world. And so let's pray for his wife and family, for his church, for the country of South Africa, and for the, the church worldwide, and for people who have just come to appreciate him so much, because he has been such a, a beautiful soul and indeed a guiding light to, I think, all of us, whether we realize it or not. He's just made such a difference in the world. And then, a good friend, Marlena Bunau, who attends um, Lihue United Church, she has some serious health issues regarding her heart and going through some other things. Um, I got to know uh, Marlena, especially through our work in youth ministry in the association, and she's just done her very best to get kids from some of the churches in Lihue to attend some of the association and conference events, and she hasn't been able to participate in church or in youth ministry at all. But I talked to her this last week, and um, she, she told me what was going on, and I just said, would you like for us to pray for you? And she said she would love it. So let's remember Marlena, who's dealing with some serious health issues. Um, 
I don't see any additional prayer requests, but um, I would just ask for us to spend just a moment in silent prayer. Lift up all your requests to God and also any joys that you would like to give thanks for. And after just a moment, I'll lead us in a verbal prayer. Let us pray together. Oh God, during this season where we indeed know tension, not only in our personal lives and in our families and communities, but we're so aware that we live in a world where there is lots of tension and conflict. God, in the midst of all of it, we give you thanks that your love shows up, your presence, your light in every place. And so we ask that we would look for your light and your love even in the darkest corners of communities and of nations where it seems like there is so little light and love. God, in the midst of this, we give you thanks for the beautiful souls that we have had the opportunity to live among, to hear, to read. And I pray for the family and good close friends of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. We ask, O oh God, that you comfort them, remind them of what a beautiful soul he has been in such light and what a difference he's made in this world, not only in South Africa, but I believe in every part of the world. I thank you for his example and for his love. And when someone this great passes, O oh God, we ask that they would continue to live on not only in our memories, but also in our actions, in our hearts, in our decisions. And God, we also pray for those who are suffering, those who are in pain, those who have had surgeries, and those who have been injured. We pray, O oh God, for healing. We pray for those who care for them, that you Give them wisdom to make wise, to help them make wise decisions. And God, on this day after Christmas, we give you thanks for the joy and the hope and the peace and the love that Jesus brought to the world. May we embrace all of that. May we allow all of that to overflow in our lives, out into the lives of others. Oh God, we pray all these things in the name of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Angel 
perfect song to end this service on. And now I invite you to uh, take your face mask and put it back on, fully cover your nose and mouth and when you're able, and if you're able to stand for the benediction. And as a reminder, we ask for you to keep your face mask on until you're either off the property or back to your vehicle. And now may the love of God, the grace of our Savior Jesus Christ, and the comfort and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all people now and forever. Merry Christmas.